I said I'll start with the greatest, and these three are just amazing. I actually want to point out one thing to you. You know, when you, when you came in, you probably were met with a number of staff, whether on the 21st or 22nd side. Yesterday and today, they volunteered. There were about 20 of them that volunteered the time to help us with this meeting. And particularly, if you think about yesterday was Sunday, and it wasn't that warm either last night. So if you have a chance when you see them, thank them, as I do, for all the wonderful work they're doing and volunteering so hard for all of us. So thank you. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the past presidents of IOM. As I said, you know, we're certainly building on their shoulders. Uh, I think present here, if I can ask them to stand, is uh, I see Ken Shine here. Ken, thank you. Um, Sam Thier. Sam. Javi Feinberg. Javi. Stuart Bondrand. I don't think I saw David Hamburg this morning. Is he here? He's not here. Okay, He's good. Here. Okay, good. He was here yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. So thank you so much. And let me just move the program on to say this is going to be a very exciting program. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge the program planning committee. Uh, that includes the following. And for those who are here, please stand and hold your applause to the end. Uh, David Raumann, of course, the chair. Jeffrey Gordon, Laura Hooper, Al Rees, Tachi Amada, Clyde Benny, Lauren Schoen, and Chelsea Frakes. Thank you all of you for a great job. So today's uh, program will be webcast live and can be accessed on our website, www.iom.edu. In addition, this meeting is being live treated by Twitter using, I'm sure you all do this anyway, right? <laughs> using the hashtag, I'm going to try to read it now, pound sign IOM2014 meeting dot. All right. So now, without further ado, I'd like to invite to podium the chair of the planning committee, David Raumann, who introduced the scientific program and delivered the keynote address. Ra David Raumann is the Thomas C. and Joan Merrigan Professor in Department of Medicine in the, in, and of Microbiology Immunology, as well as a co-director of Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. I think I gave him his job last time I was there. He is also the Chief of Infectious Disease at VA Palo Alto Healthcare System. David, come on up. So first, let me just say that it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here this morning and to have a role in preparing this program for you. Um, I also want to begin with another thanks, and, and that is both to my colleagues on the planning committee, and they all played incredible roles, but especially to the staff who have continued to make this whole event um, seamless, it seems so far, and, uh, and to IOM leadership, who also played an incredible role in supporting um, both this theme and the whole idea of how we might present it. We have been brainwashed. We have been misled in our understanding of our relationship with the microbial world. The, um, 
the whole business of how we have seen our relationships with microbes, with microscopic life, um, has been uh, crafted by and, and guided by and heavily influenced by events in our past that have clearly had major um, impacts on, on our lives and, and, uh, and our welfare, and have led to images like this one. In fact, these images uh, continue very much to this day. And I certainly don't mean to uh, diminish the importance of these kinds of events, which clearly demand attention, draw attention to themselves, and therefore to one side of, of what happens when we meet up with a certain subset of the microbes um, out there in the world. In part because they are microscopic and we don't see them easily, um, there's a great deal of fear. And, and very often, of course, what it is you can't see um, is what exactly you're most fearful of. And it's led to the whole idea that the only good one is a dead one. There is a very different story that's played out over, as you will hear shortly, over billions of years that's very much different from that last set of images and that understanding. And this is the story of um, mutualism. It's a story of symbiosis. It's a story of cooperation and of communities because, in fact, microbes invariably live as communities and live everywhere. And where they do so, they establish, at the least, neutral relationships if not positive relationships with other life forms, and in fact, the planet itself. So I thought I'd just take you back about four and a half billion years, um, which means actually I have about a minute for every hundred million years. Uh, somewhere out here in uh, the three and a half billion years ago range, we believe that life began. And very soon after um, arose three lineages of life. You may not be able to read them here. The bacteria, the archaea, and a lineage that we refer to as the nuclear line. It then led to the eukarya some time later. And during that period of long period of time, uh, at least one and a half billion years, microbes were flourishing on this planet and changing the very essence of what this planet was about in many ways, including the creation of an oxygenated atmosphere. That's microbial in origin. And it was then about one and a half billion years ago that the first modern eukarya appeared. And perhaps about a billion years ago, the first metazoans. And it's only really in the last few seconds of this that would be a day that we appeared. Um, as Homo sapiens, about 200,000 years ago. It's just a, a fleeting second, really, in this whole story. And what does this mean for the message I'm trying to deliver? It means that there have been about one and a half billion years of encounters between bacteria and other microscopic life forms and eukarya, and a substantial amount of that time encounters between bacteria and metazoans. And what's happened over that time is the process of learning how to live together, um, the process of symbiosis and co-adaptation. So perhaps it shouldn't be such a surprise that um, the plant that we live on and the relationships we have are largely driven by this long history of adaptation and, and getting along. So why is it that we have this sort of almost dichotomous um, odd, maybe skewed view, view, especially we as clinicians. And it has a lot to do with the tools and the means by which we see the world around us. It was only until Antony von Leeuwenhoek in the late 1600s um, first employed the newly invented microscope that we were able, he was able, for the first time to see microscopic life. He was the first to describe it. These images that he drew actually came from the scrapings of a human tooth. And he concluded that they were alive, in part because he asked the volunteer to drink some hot coffee and they stopped moving. And so uh, it partly had to do with the nature of coffee at that time. But uh, in any case, um, he concluded they were alive and they were classified on the basis of their morphology and their motility. And then, of course, cultivation techniques came along. And um, late 1800s or so, 
And it was very shortly thereafter that Razumov and a number of others realized that the counts of microbial life that one obtained on a plate were really very different from the counts that one had from the microscope view. So the lens of cultivation was not a particularly accurate lens either. And it had a lot to do with the fact that we were trying to isolate organisms which spend their lives as part of communities. But we want to isolate them because that's sort of how we do things in this world. And, and so now the last century has been um, a, a sort of, a, a, again, parallel social and scientific stories. On the one hand, an appreciation for coevolution and symbiosis. On the other hand, a continuing appreciation of disease. And all of these same principles that were developed largely by macroecologists and environmental microbiologists eventually became applied to uh, the study of humans. And that was Moore and Savage who again found the discrepancy between cell counts and visual cell counts, uh, counts on plates, counts in the microscope. The late Carl Woese in the 1980s was really the first to use molecules as a means of inferring both the, the presence and the nature of microbial life, in fact, all cellular life. He was the one who first developed and proposed the use of a particularly useful, valuable molecular sequence, that of the ribosomal RNA gene as a means of, of understanding relationships amongst all life forms. And he was the one who came up with this three domain tree of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And you will now understand why perhaps this is not so familiar to you, especially even if you look at today's biology textbooks, when you realize that the only parts of this tree of life that we can see with our naked eye are just right down here. And just to orient you, most of us are right around here on this tree. Everything else is invisible. Everything else, of course, is important, but we have had very little understanding because of these tools. And so um, my involvement of this uh, began actually at a time when I was um, about to go visit my dentist. This was 1999, and I got myself in a lot of trouble with the Stanford IRB uh, because I decided on the way to the dentist that I wanted uh, him to, instead of throwing out the material from my teeth, save it in some little tubes. And I brought it back to my lab. And uh, we, on the one hand, grew everything we could. On the other hand, sequenced what we could with, with the technology at that time. And what we found was perhaps not surprising today. It was a little bit of a surprise then, which was that about half of what we learned from both techniques was novel. But all of that novelty was really, mostly at least, discovered through the use of the sequencing and the use of these molecular um, uh, indicators of life, rather than the cultivation techniques. The late Joshua Lederberg, at the beginning of this last decade, um, spoke of us in very prescient and understanding, insightful ways about um, how we were super or supra-organisms um, together with consortia of microbes that, in fact, had made us their home for quite some time. And this institute, through the forum that he began in the 1990s, um, proposed and promoted this view uh, through a number of workshops, including one that was entitled Ending the War Metaphor. So why are we talking about this today? Um, I think, in part, you can understand that there's a history that needs to be retold again or about which we need to be reminded. But what we're really talking about is defining or redefining what it is to be human. Um, if you were an ecologist uh, from the 1800s, you would simply view us now today as islands, having been islands or habitat patches that are simply occupied by microbial communities that have adapted to this particular space on the planet. And for those of you who haven't yet heard these interesting little factoids, um, on a cell-by-cell -cell count basis, you are 10 parts microbe and one part human. And if you want to count unique genes, it's even more staggering because you are about 150 parts microbial unique gene and one part human gene. But this is really a story about, again, about co-adaptation um, and about crosstalk, about communication um, and relationship building. And so you could view us as a, an ecologic system that's under selective pressure 
for two purposes, to minimize conflict between the members of our communities and maximize the host, the environmental fitness, that's us. What are those fitness benefits that we derive from these relationships? This is a, an incomplete list, uh, for sure, but an important list because you start to gaze at some of these properties, the food that you digest. Without your microbes, any of the green leafy material that you ingest would simply pass right through. The nutrition that you derive from your food is, again, largely crafted by, determined by your microbes. Your ability to process in very different ways, and each of you somewhat differently, environmental chemicals. Um, so you begin to think now about heavy metal exposures and other kinds of both foreign and naturally occurring compounds. It's your microbiota that is largely determining how and whether you process them into various derivative compounds. Your metabolic regulation is, in fact, in part, the product of this symbiotic relationship in which a number of microbial small molecules make their way into your bloodstream and elsewhere and help you, help us, um, determine how we will process and regulate and manage energy. The list goes on, including, not the least of which at the bottom, um, our ability to, to resist invasive species taking over. These would be the pathogens that are so good at doing that and are special for that reason. But this, again, is a two-way street, and we don't often talk about their needs and their benefits, um, but they do derive important ones. They have, in fact, over long periods of time, decided that we are their home and, and no other place will be. Um, they derive nutrition, a habitat, and a means of dispersal. But we don't understand these well, and I would argue that we should be spending a little more time on that. So there are some important questions that come from this perspective. How can we understand these ecosystem services a bit better? How can we measure them? What do these properties mean for um, determinants of individuality? In fact, do we all have slightly different, distinct, um, both communities and benefits that we derive and, and vulnerabilities at the same time? If you agree that these communities are important for health, then we should be concerned about and try to understand the stability of the system and how it responds to disturbance. And then, of course, um, think hard about what this now means for our ability to understand and manage health, prevent disease, and restore health when needed. And so these are the kinds of questions you're going to hear explored today. Um, I think we're at early days in, for, for many of these efforts, but still, there are some very exciting observations. And um, needless to say, this field has generated a lot of interest in recent years, in part, I think, because of technology development, um, because we can see the microbiota so much more easily, uh, and also a convergence of thinking from different disciplines, including that of ecology, that of environmental sciences, that of health, um, and many others. So I'm just going to uh, tell you a little bit about some of the early findings and observations in many ways, there are too few answers, but certainly some really interesting questions. And they begin with, who's there, bless you, and what are they doing, the communities? So we do have a, a reasonable picture now emerging of who are these, who are, who are the members of these human microbial communities. Um, one of the most interesting, at least to me, um, early findings is that in contrast, to the hundred or so deep lineage, uh, lineages of the bacterial world. You remember that top left domain, the bacterial domain? It's got about a hundred phylum level lineages. There are very few of them that we find in the human body. In fact, very few that we find in animals. It, they tend to be the same ones. And these colors indicate those phyla, those commonly found phyla at each of the commonly colonized sites of the body. Um, their names are shown here. Um, in some ways, they're not important, but I will say at the same time that despite what seems to be a very simple and monotonous picture, it is anything but. Each of these segments of these pies is in fact a wealth of diversity, but the diversity that makes us special as humans and distinct from other animals, and even the diversity that makes each of you distinct as human individuals, lies at the level of genre 
and species and strains. And that's the part that's actually a little bit harder to measure these days, even still. But it raises interesting questions like, why these phyla and not others? What is it about humans that either selects for or allows certain kinds of taxa to flourish? And you're going to hear more about that today. Um, there are some early indicators. A very interesting paper by Jeff Gordon came out just recently looking at what happens when one um, introduces microbiota from different host species into a germ-free mouse. And one of the interesting findings is that there are subsets of all microbial communities that can make a go um, in the gut of a mouse. But of course, those that do well um, tend to be those that came from guts elsewhere, even termites, and less so ones that came from mouths or skin. And they also tend to be organisms that know how to make use of the resources and exploit the habitat that they now occupy. We know something about the nature of variation in these patterns of diversity. Um, we know that where you are looking within the human body is one of the most important determinants of what it is you find. And then, lesser so, but still important, the individual in whom you're looking, their health status, their genetics, which of course is one part of individuality, the other part of which is history. Where have you been as a human being on this planet since you left your mother? Um, not so literally, but in terms of you know, what you have eaten and where you have lived and what you have done and with whom you have had um, close associations. And so these are the other kinds of determinants that are now being explored in great detail, including diet and others. And you, again, will hear about these later today. Um, lest you think that the gut is the center of the universe here, um, it is not. This is, these are measures of diversity. The Shannon Index is a form of, of diversity measurement. It's based upon in part numbers of different taxa, but also their relative abundances. And right in the center, that green bar here, um, that's the, the, the poop, the, the distal gut, and its diversity score, basically. Um, way up here at the top, it's the human mouth. In fact, when we look at other animals, and we've been looking at marine mammals recently, um, there's an incredible diversity of taxa, and, and we think function as well, um, out here in the mouth. And at the other end, um, so to speak, um, the vagina. It's the least diverse, which is not to say the least important, but in terms of numbers of taxa and functions, perhaps. So how is it that we go about measuring these things, the taxa, the functions, etc.? Well, I mentioned the phylogenetically reliable gene sequences that uh, Carl Woese first learned how to recover and study. Um, we now have, through technology, um, the ability to sequence very broadly. This is what's called shotgun sequencing or metagenomic sequencing. This is where um, the net sum pool of nucleic acid is prepared uh, for sequencing and examined um, for genes and genomes um, and then reconstructed as such. We can look at RNA transcripts to see which genes are being activated. We can look at proteins being made to see which of those transcripts might be trans translated. Um, and we can look at small molecules, which are very often the results of sequential synthetic processes that come from many cluster, many genes clustered together often, as you will hear about as well. When it's all said and done, we still don't have terribly um, direct ways of measuring function, true function of these communities. What exactly are they doing and how with us to cause those beneficial properties that I showed you on a previous slide. So that's one of the big uh, goals, I believe, today. Um, and then, of course, we must be mindful that they don't live alone. In fact, they do live and choose to live with us, and we need to be marrying the measurements of human with uh, microbe. Uh, I mentioned the, the vast numbers of unique genes and potential functions that are found within us. This is one of the, the first studies that used metagenomic sequencing and came up with something on the order of about a half million unique genes that are found in each of our guts. Um, these genes, when you gaze at what it is they might be um, encoding, are functions that would relate to degradation of complex sugars. Um, these are largely food stuffs. 
um, but also the capacity to ferment and a variety of other processes which you don't find in the human genome. They are very much the complement of what it is we don't have that we, that we do need today. Michael Fishbach, who is here today and you'll hear from later, um, has been looking recently about at these gene clusters that are predicted and in several cases now shown to, um, to be involved in the, in the uh, production of important biologically active small molecules. Um, and this is really a staggering uh, sort of set of numbers and a story that's emerging. I mentioned that there are a large number of these molecules in our bloodstream, but when you look at the capacity of our communities to make interesting compounds that we don't know how to make, the, it's really uh, amazing. Um, 3,000 were identified uh, from a net collective of many samples, but each of us has on the order of many hundreds of these gene clusters, each making important small molecules um, found in our gut and even more so in the mouth, as I already alluded before, and that the ones, that the few that we recognized before turn out to be relatively rare. It's the ones that, um, that we didn't know anything about that we're finding in, in many, many different humans. So there's incredibly interesting biology to be discovered that's been at play for as you can now understand, many, many thousands of years. Here's just one example, lactocillin, a novel antibiotic discovered in a commensal um, organism found in the vagina, lactobacillus gasseri. This was a compound never before recognized, whose properties, of course, couldn't have been well studied. These molecules are being used all the time by our communities um, in order to um, communicate with each other regulate their functions as a net sum. You understand this is a cooperative force at play here. These are not individuals doing their individual thing. They are allowing each other to act as a unit. And this is how they do it, through these small molecules as a communication scheme. But they're also communicating with us all the time. And we're, in turn, taking some of these molecules, modifying them ourselves, um, and then deploying them, seeing them deployed, for a variety of different host physiologic purposes. When you start to think about this whole system and how is it that it somehow can remain constant enough to continue to provide these important benefits, um, at least I'm drawn to the imagery of the ecologist, which is in turn the imagery of physicists and meteorologists and economists, and you start thinking about um, stability domains alternative states of stability. They're, they're drawn as little valleys in which an ecosystem rests or at least um, varies in, in, within bounds and, and tends to spend uh, more time than it might elsewhere until or unless a force causes it to, uh, to be driven into an alternative state, and that would be another valley. And you have to understand that this landscape is in self dynamic as well. Um, the topology is being constantly remodeled um, because of our, the changing environment that is us. So this is an interesting kind of concept and I think one that, that helps us understand what it is that as clinicians we should be trying to understand and do. That is, understand what is the nature of a stable state that any patient might be occupying and the likelihood that that patient may suffer a major disturbance and the assumption of an alternative state associated with disease when we do certain things as we do in clinical care. And how is it that we can either reinforce or restore a stable state? These are clinical questions but driven by uh, ecology. Well, as I said, the landscape changes um, quite quickly and it especially does so early in life. Um, these little dots here are clinical samples and they come from babies and their moms who have been followed now since the day of birth by an amazing postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Elizabeth Costello. Um, this is a, a prospective cohort, and these are the data from 15 infants and their moms. It's about 4,000 samples shown here, and they're projected onto this sort of pseudo three-dimensional space in order to maximize the amount of variation that you see between each of these samples in terms of their overall composition. So the further apart these dots are, the more different are their overall communities. This is a bacterial community shown here, but of course these communities are viruses, fungi, et cetera. Um, and conversely, the ones that are close together are very similar. Well, in this projection, the coloring is based upon age. 
And you can immediately see that there seems to be a progression from red, which is birth, out to blue, which is the end of two years from which we have these data. And you can sort of see three lobes or clusters of these many samples, each heading off towards the right. And here, the coloring shows that these are the same samples. They refer, the colors and the, and the clusters refer to body site. So the red, for example, up here, this orangish, is um, the baby fecal samples, the poop samples. And they're heading towards the right, towards the mom fecal samples. They're becoming more like mom. Um, likewise, the mouth, driving towards a picture that is reminiscent and known to be associated with the adult. The skin is a different story, it seems. Um, there is sort of a constant similarity between a baby's skin and a mom's skin throughout those two years. And finally, you see that these clusters are much more commingled at birth than they are later on. In fact, what we're learning is that our body sites, as distinct as they are as, as habitats for microbial communities, are not fully differentiated when we are born. The gut is the one that actually lags the most behind and takes at least weeks to become a distinct gut-like habitat. What about adulthood? We believe that there is greater stability during adulthood, and in fact, the early data suggests that's true. Um, these are plots now of differences on the y-axis in overall community composition between different samples, pairs of samples, um, and they're drawn from two adults, as you can read, one sampled him or herself for half a year, the other went out for 15 months. This is daily sampling, a heroic effort. It actually has gone on now for five years. Um, and what you see by color coding is the distinctness now in adulthood of the body sites as habitats for distinct communities and their functions. But you see some variation up and down over time. Um, time is on the x-axis. Um, and in fact, we don't stay exactly in one place, our ecosystems, but they do vary a bit in terms of their composition and function um, over time. Although the gut, the distal gut, um, is, is always distinct from the tongue. And the skin is more or less distinct from the tongue, except for, for this one day here. Um, this is a palm that somehow became tongue-like. Um, but the, here's an interesting thing. When you look at these data, and now you plot, instead of time on the x-axis, you plot the degree of the amount of time that separates any pair of samples. The further out to the right here, the greater is the, is the distance in time between those pairs of samples and, and the converse out here on the left. And now, um, this is again an ecologic distance measurement, but regardless of which you might choose, you see that there is a slow increase in that distance between samples. And to us, although this is very early and preliminary and desperately needs to be corroborated by other studies that have gone to these lengths in terms of prospective sample collection, it does suggest that there's drift, that as we sit and age, our microbiota are becoming a little bit different from what they were. Now, does that matter? Um, to this degree? We, we don't yet know. But if you think about immunosenescence and you think about the other processes of aging, this could be either a reflection of or a contributor to those kinds of um, events. And I mentioned the importance of disturbance, um, both as a product of modern society, but also as a, a, a frequent natural kind of event. It's, it's a cleansing event. It actually can be useful and provide opportunities for um, outsiders to now enter this system. And so when you think about the response to disturbance, it's the depth of this valley uh, that, would, that would indicate the likelihood that a community will stay put and not now uh, transform itself into an alternative state. That's the, sort of the basis for resilience. And this fellow here, Buzz Hollings, who retired out of the University of Florida, began his career in Canada, was really one of the first ecologists to talk about what resilience really means. So I'll just show you a very quick little vignette. Three healthy adults, they had seen no antibiotic for a year. These were actually three of the only people we could find in the Bay Area um, <laughs> that had not had an antibiotic. Um, and we asked them to sample themselves for a couple months and, and then take an antibiotic they didn't need. Um, of course, we do this all the time in the real world, but, but here we had a deliberate study. And we've published data now on what happens to the taxa 
the composition of their communities. I just wanted to show you some data on the metabolites. It very much mirrors what you see with the taxa. Here are the three subjects in their communities one week before the ciprofloxacin and one day before. So you see there is some, some variation in the, the metabolism, the overall metabolic state of these communities. Now they get the cipro. Here's the fourth day of cipro. By this point, the taxa have changed on the order of a third or a half even, uh, which have shown major disruption in terms of abundance. These are the metabolites, and they too are showing a major change in composition and abundance in a similar fashion. Now the cipro stops. It was five days. Two days later, these communities, as seen through their metabolites, are starting to walk back in the direction from, the, from which they came, so to speak. And if you wait a week, in two cases, um, subjects uh, D in green and E in orange, these communities, by this measure, have largely returned to what they were. But you notice subject F, the blue one, um, pretty far from where that community started. And if you wait two weeks, not a lot better. And if you wait six months, no better. So that's a community that now has suffered a permanent change. The other two seem to have recovered, at least seen through this lens. But now in this study, we did the same thing six months later, another five days of ciprofloxacin. I won't show you the data, but in essence, a similar story in some ways. Shared responses as well as individualized responses. But here's the, the important point. After a second exposure, there is now a failure to recover even among the two individuals that had shown a complete recovery uh, after the first exposure. It's subtle in some cases, but measurable. And the question is, does it matter? And if so, what does this mean about the, the, the compounding of disturbance that we all experience and impart to others as clinicians um, for the accumulated effect that, that this has on, on the ecosystem? And you're going to hear more about this as well. Fortunately, there seems to be a little more attention here in this city and elsewhere around the world to this kind of problem, the problem of disturbance the overuse of antibiotics, the, the adverse consequences, which are many, many fold, one of which is classic resistance, but the others of which I'm showing you here are disturbances that can't be measured in terms of resistance genes and resistant organisms in a traditional way. These are community-wide effects. So finally, speaking of a community-wide effect, there's the community when it's acting as a unit and causing pathology. This is something that Norm Pace spoke about um, 15 years ago, and that many of us have begun to embrace. These are the diseases where there is no one pathogen. It's a net collective problem. Um, it's maybe not a problem for these communities, but it's a problem for us. They have become altered. They're in an alternative state. This one happens to be disease associated. And it's the collective action of these communities that's causing pathology, we believe. Now, I use this word causing um, in a very cautious way. And in fact, um, although we could talk about these states, and you w we will today, um, I will simply go on to say we need to be very careful, um, we and the public, as we start to think about this as one of a number of examples of multifactorial um, disease-associated uh, phenotypes. Because there may be causation here. Um, it may be causal in one of many different kinds of ways. These communities might have initiated um, a kind of pathology, or they may be propagating it as a reflection of changes that had already taken place within the host. We know that when we look in states of inflammation, we see telltale changes in our communities, our microbial communities. Were they the cause of the inflammation? Not necessarily, and in many cases we know they weren't. So they adapt as well, and now perhaps propagate as another form of causation. Um, this is a problem that is not new to us, though, and to many of you far more so than to me. There's been a great deal of deep thinking about what happens when you can't isolate a causal factor and reproduce the, the disease at hand in the relevant host, which you can't here. Well, there are other ways of approaching causation, and you're going to hear more today about the, 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 how epidemiologists, environmental uh, health people have addressed the same kind of problem in building a case for causation using a number of criteria um, 
to, to argue for causal relationships when, in fact, um, uh, the other approaches may not work. And you can easily see in something like undernutrition, malnutrition, where you have an altered microbiota, but, and I don't know if you can read these, you also have a number of other factors which could have arisen de novo or from other re causes, including, of course, di altered dietary intake, impaired immune responses, invasive infections, all of which may have caused or promoted an altered microbiota, but all of which together lead to this, this sort of uh, terrible phenotype, which becomes very difficult to alter if one simply takes one of those factors and says, I'm going to fix that one thing. How about the, the dietary intake? I'm going to use therapeutic food. And we've heard some yesterday at this meeting about efforts of these sorts. Generally, they have not been so effective. They certainly have been durable. Um, and I would argue that we have not addressed the other factors in thinking about strategies which might be coordinated and compounded to force the system now into one of these alternative states using a variety of concomitant measures. What are the measures being used today? They are pretty crude, um, but surprisingly effective in a very small number of settings. And this is one setting in which there are good data to show that this ancient practice of, um, of fecal transplantation does, in fact, have some benefit. It's, it's shocking, but, but dramatic for those of you who have not seen this um, happen. That's not to say that this is the cure for all that ails us, um, although many in the past have actually argued that. A famous Chinese uh, physician in the 5th century AD um, was known for promoting the free and, and wanton use of, of feces to, to cure all kinds of problems of the world. It seems we're back, actually, to that, to that approach right now. Um, so what more could we hope in terms of ways of applying this information? Well, um, I think we have some brand new ways of thinking about risk assessment and environmental health uh, management. Because if the microbiome is playing a, a role in how we respond to harmful chemicals, and each of us varies in how our microbiotas do that and the degree to which they do, then we have a way of assessing the vulnerability of each of us to the same environmental exposure, say it's arsenic in South Asia, um, and a way of classifying hosts and, uh, and tiering and, um, and addressing therapies appropriately. We um, can see that there will be, and Victor mentioned this very briefly, um, technologies that will allow us to learn more about the parts of this ecosystem which still remain somewhat terra incognita. The small intestine, I would say, is still that kind of place. We really do not know what is happening, even who's there in the small intestine, because all of the samples that we've had so far have come from resections at surgery, um, or, of course, even worse, uh, and very little has come from living, breathing, healthy people. But I can imagine, certainly, technologies that would allow us to do that. Um, I mentioned very briefly the idea that a microbiome may be a gold mine of new therapies and important biological molecules. And then finally, the idea of manipulating the whole system. And I could see, we can see that there are many ways in which that might happen, from strain targeting to strain introduction to drugs that alter overall or specific activities, and a very different way of thinking about precision medicine. So, we're going to return to some of these themes. I, I hope I haven't taken too much time. Um, you've seen the program. I just want to tell you that the idea that we had was that for each of these important themes and topics, we wanted people from very different disciplines and backgrounds to get together and have a conversation with themselves and, more importantly, with you. And that, in fact, we all have found that when you get an ecologist together with a chemist, together with a clinician, together with uh, a meteorologist even, that amazing insights and new ideas um, happen. And uh, some of you have certainly taken part in activities of that sort. I know many of you here, for example, on the problem of prematurity have taken this kind of, of transdisciplinary approach. And I, I think that's a really important thing. So that's, that was the idea behind the, the program. Finally, let me just say, I'm a clinician, as you know, as all you, many of you are. I, I was taught to be a warrior. Um, and deploy the weaponry, the antibiotics of my trade, the infectious disease trade, um, I'm afraid that we have adopted a little bit of the wrong imagery and the wrong mindset. And 
I am trying to promote the idea that maybe in one side of us ought to be that of the park ranger. We have a park that is our responsibility. We need to understand what are the native species, what are they doing, if there is an invasive species present, how do we target it so as not to disturb the whole park, and how to manage it better. And there are all kinds of very good analogies for how, and actually good lessons for how this might be done. Um, so it simply remains for us to go out and talk to our, our colleagues in other fields and think more deeply about what it is that we have responsibility to do here um, that will lead, I think, to a, a very positive future. So thank you for your attention, and um, we'll have time for more conversation.